Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. We're going to talk about vector fields today. Oh, that's what this crazy madness is over here, but I'll explain what that means here in just a sec. Let me give you the definition first, all right? So first things first, we are going to let, this is a definition, let's put a little def up here, let uh, D be a set of points in R2. A vector field, a vector field, Man, it's been a weird weekend, guys. Bear with me. Um, on R2. Okay, so this is going to be on R2, which is a little bit weird, but you'll see why. It's just a function. It's a function f such that um, each point, each x, y in R2 is assigned, is assigned, a two-dimensional vector, a two-dimensional, uh, let's just go 2D vector, f of x, y. In other words, you hand me a point, I hand you back a vector. Now that vector is going to have length. Now the weird thing about this that you have to sort of understand is the way that it's written first and foremost, you'll see these written as capital, they're usually bolded, f of x, y, and then you'll see them written as p of x, y, i, plus q of x, y, j, all right? Or you'll see it written like this, p of x, y, and then q of x, geez louise, let me try that again, q of x, y, sorry guys, bear with me, q of x, y, Oh, that's supposed to be a vector, bear with me. <laughs> or uh, a shorthand way of writing it is f equals p i i plus q j. It's written like that. Now, what does that really mean? Because that's intimidating as heck. What it means, well, let's go to this example here for just a second. I'm going to blow this thing up so you can check it out a little bit better. Now, the way that this was written in Desmos makes it a little bit tricky, but what we have here is, in this case, it says f1 of xy is y, f2 of xy is negative x plus y. I'm actually, I'm going to change this one a little bit. Let's call this x plus y. Shift x plus y, and we'll sort of see what happens. In this case, over here, what they're saying is p of x, y, I guess what I'm saying is x plus y, and q of x, y is negative x plus y. So I could rewrite this if I wanted to. I could write this as f equals x plus y, i, i, plus negative x plus y, J. See how it looks super intimidating, but we're we're really not all that frightened about it at all. Okay. All right. Now let's let's see how these these things um, how they act. All right. Look real close. Now I haven't really figured out what's going on with Desmos in terms of how this does this, but I'm going to turn this. We're going to just deal with it here. All right. If you look close. Now first things first. Let's pick a point. Let's pick one comma one. If I put one comma one in, now remember, this is going to give me my horizontal component, and this is going to spit out my vertical component. So if I plug in one comma one, I should get two, because last I checked, one plus one is two. Negative one plus one is zero. So now, clearly this isn't too long. Can you see that? But it starts, its tail starts at zero, or at one comma one, and then it's heading in the direction of two comma zero. But I can't have this thing go all the way over here because then everything overlaps. So what they do is they sort of tweak this. Let's take a look at one of these big daddies. Let's take a look at this guy right here. That looks like negative seven, two. So if I plug in negative seven, two, right, I will get, let's see, negative seven, two. I will get in the x direction, I will get negative seven, two is negative five. I want to make sure I'm in the right spot here, right here, right? Negative 7, 2 will be negative 5 in the, in the horizontal component, and negative 7, 2 is going to be negative negative 7, which is 9, or excuse me, 7 plus 2, which is 9. So if I'm heading over here, if I were to go over, what did I say? I said negative 5 and then up 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I were to draw a lot, look at that, it does catch it ever so nicely, doesn't it? So that's sort of the slope. Now clearly we can't draw that. Let me go back to my 
let me go back here. If I want f of, in this case, what did I say? I said negative, what was that? It was negative 5, 2, or uh, negative 7, 2. I know that that is going to equal negative 5i plus 9j. If I try to draw that vector with its tail sitting right here at negative 7, 2, well, you can imagine, this thing's going to be impossible to read. However, do know do notice that longer vectors are they're just scaled so apparently let's see what did we say this thing would be what 25 plus its its length would be 25 plus 81 which is uh, root 106 well it's 106 so its magnitude would be root 106 which is a little bigger than 10 so when I go back here apparently the, that length right there is about 10 as opposed to um, uh, the actual plotting the actual vector. So you can sort of see how these work. Now where it gets interesting, and we're going to play with these in class, is if I let z change. Now I don't really understand, since my f1 and my f2 are both functions of just x and y, if I let my z change, notice that none of the vectors change, but Desmos does something funky. If somebody can tell me what's going on with that, I would greatly appreciate it. Like I don't understand What's happening with the little arms? It's like people are saying, hi, hi, look, over here, over here. Sorry, that was so lame. Okay, anyway, um, but notice the size of the vectors don't change. So not really sure when they program this guy how, the, how that plays into what we're looking at. Now, if I've got, you, you can see where this is going, right? I'm going to make this guy a little bit bigger so we can see. What if I have an f of x, y? and z. Well, it's just an extension into 3 space, right? So now what I have is I've got p of x, y, z, i plus q of x, y, z, j plus r of x, y, z, and k. And that's it. Now think about, I, I can't do this in Desmos. I think I think we can in Mathematica. We might be able to in GeoGebra. Maybe uh, some of you guys, as my students, can can figure that out and take a look at it. They're in our book, which is really cool. They're really cool. We can see how they play out. But now, if you look, let, let's say that f is equal to x squared y i plus uh, z j plus two x plus y. Okay, okay. Now, if I want to plug in 0, 0, 0, if I start at the origin, well, that's pretty easy. I get 0, right? But let's say that I wanted to do, I would just have the 0 vector. But let's say that I wanted to do, say, f of 1, 2, 3. Well, now I'm starting, I'm starting, this is x, this is y, and this is z, and I go over a wood, and then over two, and then I have three, so at some point right here, right? Then this guy's gonna be what? One squared is one times two, so this is two i plus three j plus, and then what do I have? I got two plus two, which is four k. So now I, when I go to draw this thing, this vector, well, what's that gonna do? It's headed in to this direction, right, then positive 3 in this direction, and then up 4 in this direction. So it would look like that. But again, when we have these three-dimensional uh, vector fields, when, when you see them graphed, if, if I try to graph a whole family of these things, the vectors are going to be laying over each other. They're literally going to be lying on top of each other, and they'd be really, really difficult to visualize. So what they end up doing in the software, which I think is pretty cool, is they change the color of them. Certain colors imply longer, other colors imply shorter. Okay. Now, um, so if I if if I generalize this three-dimensional vector from the two-dimensional vector, instead of that d, we would simply say this is again another definition. I would simply say let e be subset of R three this time, right? So in other words, I'm grabbing I'm grabbing values this f, f this x y z from R three, right? Then a vector field. A VF is a function, is a function, right? I just take that point, stuff it in this guy, and what pops out is a function that 
creates a vector, a vector, and it's a vector valued function, right, in R3. And we call that f of x, y, z, right? That's it. So you get these vector valued functions, and then all that we do is we graph little snapshots, little stick figures of the vectors at each one of the points. Now the difference is, is that we put the tail at the point that we're trying to analyze. All right, so this is supposed to represent f of 1, 2, 3. Now you may say, but Ripley, but Ripley, vectors are mobile. I can move them wherever you want. Absolutely. But when I'm trying to make a field of them, then I need to put that vector's tail at the point so I know where it came from. Otherwise, think about what would happen. Everything would just be bristling out of the origin, and we wouldn't have any idea what was really going on. Now, there's a, excuse me, there's another kind of vector field that's called the gradient field, right? So if I have a gradient, the gradient field, Excuse me. Well, you can already imagine what a gradient field is. It's pretty cool, too. A gradient field is simply, it's written like this. Gradient f of, well, I'm sorry, this is how we write the gradient, right? So this is f, x, at x, y, and then I plug in my i, and then plus f, y, just taking my partials, right, of x, y, and I could plug in a, b's and do all that fun stuff, and I plug in my j. Now, guess what? This is a vector field. This is a vector field, right? You plug in values, you get vectors out, and I can make that vector, this function spits out the vector field, which is pretty cool, okay? So it's called the gradient vector field, or the gradient field. All right, sometimes you'll see this guy written in three space, of course, right? So now, just like I said before, you hand me an ordered triple, and what happens? Well, I plug it into my partials, right? And out pops exactly what I need. And I'm not afraid because I've dealt with partials, I've dealt with vector valued functions, and now all we're doing is doing little sketches of the vectors at, at basically lattice points, right? This is going to be x, y, and z, although we can basically put them wherever we want them, okay? Now, this is a really brief description of what vector fields are, and we're going to get into them because vector fields are cool. They give us things like force fields, which you guys have dealt with, electric fields. We're going to use them a bunch in this final chapter um, that we're dealing with in vector calculus, which is crazy and <laughs> super fun. We're also going to get our brains wrapped around sort of graphically what vector fields look like. So again, I didn't want to get crazy um, with vector fields, but I did want to, uh, I want to give you a brief introduction and then we'll get into some graphical examples and some real life examples um, in class. Okay? We'll also, hopefully, we'll be able to find some good um, some good software that we can work. I've, I've scoured the internet. The best one that I've seen is, is what, however Saul Khan got his, that's a good one. That may be GeoGebra. We may have to look that one up. I may have to purchase that for future videos. Anyway, thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Um, and I will see you in class tomorrow. Don't panic if you're, if you're struggling with these guys just a little bit. They're super, super easy. Um, they just get, they're, they're just really cool to, uh, to graph and to play with. All right. I'll see you guys in class tomorrow. Have a good day.